So what is physics? What is it that we're going to learn about in this semester? Well, in a previous segment, I mentioned that physics is really all about um, the application of mathematics to the physical world. All right, so we create these physical, these models, which are mathematical models, and we apply mathematics to draw conclusions from them. Broadly speaking, physics covers motion, heat and energy, electricity and magnetism, matter, um, one that's really important to me on, that's not on this list are waves, right? sound, light, and maybe my favorite topic of all, the ultimate nature of reality. What on earth is happening here, right? We're all sharing this, this bizarre experience, right? The, the human experience that we're all sharing. Um, what, what is the, the nature of that? Um, and what can we learn about it by using our senses and, um, and, and, and logic? And that's possibly my, my favorite thing to talk about. And we'll, we'll get to touch on that a little bit as we go through and particularly at the end of the next semester, when we get into some modern physics, uh, we're going to get into some really interesting uh, stuff that I think is going to make you think a little bit more about what is the ultimate nature of this experience that we are sharing. So science is based on theories, and a theory is a construct that adequately, adequately explains observed phenomena. And theory is one of these words that's used very differently in everyday life than it is in, in a scientific setting, right? I could say, um, I have a theory that my sourdough bread tastes better when I rise it in the refrigerator than when I rise it on the counter. Okay. Eh, what do I mean by that? Well, it's just a notion. It's really my opinion, right? Tastes better. That's my opinion, right? So a theory in everyday life can really come down to opinion, right? And we can almost have those be synonymous in, in, in the vernacular, in everyday language. But in science, theory means something very different. In science, theory means something that has been repeatedly uh, demonstrated to be useful. So, in the previous segment, I mentioned Newton's second law. Again, the force is equal to mass times acceleration. And, and like I said, in that segment, don't feel like you have to understand this equation. We're going to spend several chapters talking about this equation. So, but this is a theory. And again, uh, Newton published this the first time in the 1600s. It can't be proven by logic, right? There's no, no train of logic that leads to this. It's just his idea. It's just his idea. And here we are uh, almost 400 years later, and we still are pretty sure it's true. Why? If it can't be proven by logic, why do we think it's true? And, and how is this different than just my idea, my, my opinion about my bread? How is it different? Well, because this has repeatedly been shown to be useful. What do I mean by that? I mean that if I use this equation in the design of my skyscraper, then I'm pretty sure it's going to stand up, right? I don't just have to build a skyscraper, see if it falls down, and then yeah, make a few tweaks and build it again. No, I can use this theory... I can base my design on this idea using mathematics, and if I believe this, and I've used logic and good algebra and good mathematics to apply this to my specific situation, my skyscraper, then if I believe this and my logic is good, then my skyscraper should stand up. That's what we mean by it. It's over and over again for 400 years. It's been proven to work. I shouldn't have used that word proven. It's been demonstrated to work. But it can't be proved by pure logic. Um, you know, it's interesting, in the 60s, a mathematician named Goodell actually proved that no self-consistent logical system can exist without being based on some assumptions. And so, in physics, we have these big ideas. Newton's second law, Newton's theory of gravity, um, Einstein's theory of relativity. We have these big ideas that can't really be proven by logic, but... We can do logic, apply logic to those theories to apply them to a specific situation if it works over and over and over and over again to help us understand the world we live in, then we start to trust it. And it moves into the realm of being an accepted scientific theory. And if it's really important and really works and really stands the test of time and is really fundamental, then we give it a name and we call it a law. And so this is Newton's second law. But the difference between a law and a theory 
is largely history and um, sort of relevance and importance. We use them because they work, right? So we don't think that this is truth with a capital T. We think this works with a capital W. So these theories lead to models, right? And so here's one model. This is a mathematical model. Here's another theory of gravity. This is Newton's model of gravity. And Newton's model of gravity works. It works fantastically. It works so well. Um, it works really well to predict the motion of the planets. Uh, you can land a person on the moon using Newton's theory of gravity. It works fantastically. But it doesn't work everywhere. It turns out it's not good enough to predict the motion of Mercury over long periods of time. Over short periods of time, it does just fine. Over long periods of time, we find errors. We find it is not perfect. So Newton's theory of gravity, which we will learn about here in a few chapters, it's a fantastic theory. It's not perfect. It's not truth with a capital T. It works with a capital W. In fact, in the early 20th century, Einstein came along and proposed a new theory of gravity called the general theory of relativity, which works everywhere. It can predict the motion of the planet. Yeah, it can put a man on the moon, you bet, but it can also predict the motion of Mercury over long time periods. Um, Newton's theory of gravity is not accurate enough to make the GPS in your phone work. In fact, if we use Newton's theory of gravity for our GPS location, uh, it would be off by like 100 meters after one day. It's not accurate enough for every application. However, Einstein's general theory of relativity is. So... Newton's theory of gravity has been supplanted by Einstein's. We still learn about Newton's because it still works in almost every situation. And it's much more accessible than uh, the general theory of relativity, which requires some pretty sophisticated mathematics to wrap your brain around. Broadly speaking, we could kind of group the theories of physics into four boxes. Classical physics, quantum mechanics, relativity, and relativistic quantum mechanics. And these are sort of different realms that cover different aspects of this universe. So relativity in quantum mechanics and relativistic quantum mechanics, so all three of these really, we cl classify as modern physics. All of these, this is all physics of the 20th century and the 21st century. Classical physics is, is what we term physics prior to about 1900. At the end of the 1900s, excuse me, at the end of the 1800s, Physicists and scientists in, in many disciplines, really, thought they pretty much had everything wrapped up. Now, there are a few pesky details that had to get sorted out, but most folks thought they were just that, details that had to get sorted out. However, they were wrong. It turns out that these few pesky details led to a revolution in physics around the turn of the century, uh, which gave us relativity and quantum mechanics. This is really still in the future. It turns out relativity and quantum mechanics have not been reconciled. There is no consistent theory that works with quantum mechanics and relativity. So this is the frontier of physics right now. Where do these different things apply? Well, classical mechanics applies to human-sized phenomena. That's why it's classical physics, because that's where physicists started. Human-sized phenomena, things that are going fairly slow. Ah, a car is fairly slow in the cosmic realm of Ah, an airplane, even a spaceship. Those are all pretty slow. Uh, well, a human-created spaceship, not a spaceship of the mind. A human-created spaceship, spaceships that we've actually created, um, are fairly slow in the cosmic scheme of things compared to the speed of light. Right? So classical physics deals with, you know, human-sized objects, rulers, pens, utility knives, pipes, right? That's what classical physics deals with. Uh, that's mostly what we're going to be studying in this class. At the end of the next semester, we're going to get a chance to talk a little bit about relativity and quantum mechanics. Relativity applies to very high speeds and very high gravity. So high speeds like, you know, some fraction of the speed of light. You know, something like, you know, more than 10% or something like that. Or more than 1% of the speed of light. Something like that. Um, high speed and high gravity, too. Turns out the orbit of Mercury is not predictable over long time periods uh, with Newton's law of gravity because gravity is very strong. Gravity is so strong that we need 
uh, to use Einstein's theory of relativity to get the correct answer. Quantum mechanics applies to the very, very smallest of things. Quantum mechanics applies to atoms, um, electrons, protons, neutrons, molecules. Those all obey the laws of quantum mechanics. And like I said before, physicists can connect classical mechanics to relativity. It's a smooth transition, right? There isn't a break between one theory and the other. In other words, we think about classical physics as the low-speed version of relativity. They work great together. You know, classical physics and quantum mechanics, for the most part, jive also. There's no real conflict there. But quantum mechanics and relativity, again, nobody's found a way to reconcile those two for very small things moving at very high speeds. In other words, there is no quantum theory of gravity. Yeah, maybe you'll figure it out one day. Someone's gonna. Maybe it's gonna be you. Okay. Qua and I love talking about modern physics. You know, in relativity, we learn things like um, that length and time are not universal. In other words, uh, you know, if I measure uh, a three-minute long, uh, I'm watching a Justin Bieber video that's three minutes long, and you fly by in your super fast spaceship, you know what? Uh, you're going to disagree on how long that video was. You're, you're not going to think it's three minutes long. We'll both be right. Oh, it's so weird. I love learning about that stuff. Okay, quantum mechanics is a study of very small. Uh, we find that when we study electrons, protons, and neutrons, maybe we've got this picture in our mind of these as like little balls. Yeah, it's not a bad model, but really they're very wavy. They have no specific location. They interact in very, very strange ways. I love that stuff too. Uh, we'll get to a little bit of that at the end of the second semester. Most of this class is concentrated in classical physics, which is also very, very cool.